Hello and welcome to the Metaphysical Emporium. I'm Marcus Adair, and this is the fifth part of the series I'm calling The Road to Modern Witchcraft. We covered parts one through four in separate videos that are available on YouTube. In the fourth part of The Road to Modern Witchcraft, we talked about Pamela Pixie Coleman Smith, Arthur Edward Waite, the Tarot, Margaret Murray, the New Forest Coven, Dafo, and Gerald Gardner. If you have not checked these videos out, please do so. As always, you can post any comments or questions. You can also email questions as well. I want to take a moment and wish everyone a happy June. Not only is it my birthday month, but more importantly, it's Pride Month. So happy Pride Month to all, and I hope everyone has fun, but stays safe. Please subscribe to the channel and like the video. It helps me out a great deal. Also, the Metaphysical Emporium has launched a Twitter page as well as a Facebook page. So please check out those as well. Before we begin, I'm going to apologize in advance for any mispronunciations. The year is 1948. Let's talk about Robert Graves and his work called The White Goddess. Born Robert Van Ronk Graves, Graves was a British poet and historical novelist. Graves was a classicalist. A classicalist traditionally refers to the study of classic Greek and Latin literature, which may also include Greco-Roman philosophy, historical, I'm sorry, history and archaeological works as well. Graves was a Celt Celticologist, which studied the Celtic people. He also studied Irish mythology. Graves produced more than 140 literary works in his lifetime, many still in print today. He was born into a middle-class family in what is now South London. Graves was plagued by childhood illness, double pneumonia, followed by the measles. He was educated at Charterhouse, one of the great nine English public schools. Uh, he won a classical exposition, exposition at St. John's College, Oxford. Graves was a bisexual, but the word Graves used was pseudo-homosexual. I'm sure in the early 1900s they did not have the terminology that we have today. Before we talk about his work, The White Goddess, I want to read a quote so that you can get a little better understanding of how Graves operated. In an article by Morgan Demlier on the Living Luminary website, I quote, Graves still had the Victorian mentality that said it was perfectly fine to invent history if the story you were spinning seemed logical to you. A very telling statement. All right, The White Goddess was a book-length essay on the nature of poetic myth-making. It was first published in 1948, corrected, revised, and enlarged editions appeared in 1948, 1952, and 1961. The White Goddess is based on earlier articles published in Wales Magazine, a literary journal. Graves proposes the existence of a European deity, the White Goddess of Birth, Love, and Death, inspired and represented by the phases of the moon. Graves first wrote the book under the title The Roebuck in the Thicket in a three-week period during January of 1944. He then renamed it The Threefold Muse, finishing and retitling it as The White Goddess. Finally, The White Goddess was published in May 1948 in the UK and in June 1948 in the US. Many of the concepts Graves put forth have great value today. Some of the concepts have led to deep and meaningful theology. The book draws from the mythology and poetry of Wales and Ireland, Western Europe, and the ancient Middle East. The White Goddess is arguably one of the single most influential books to shape modern paganism today. Graves admitted freely he was not a medieval historian but a poet. So I believe that he was attempting to be honest about what he created. From Graves, we get many of the concepts that are fundamental to mainstream paganism, the triple goddess, 
Oak and Holly Kings, the Celtic Tree Calendar, Druidic Gods. An important note here, these concepts don't date back before Graves' book and are not historically Celtic. Let's talk about Graves' concept of the Triple Goddess. Graves outlines the Triple Goddess based on the relationship between poet and muse. He describes the Triple Goddess in a various ways as bride, mother, layer out or death goddess, girl, woman, and hag. Here we see what is more commonly known as the maiden, mother, and crone. Graves all, Grave also related the Triple Goddess to spring, summer, and fall, the new full and waning moon. Graves uses a very misogynistic tone when describing the Triple Goddess. Again, that's not uncommon for the times. An example, uh, mother, bride, layer out. The mother gives birth and nurtures the poet. The bride marries him and is his lover. The layer out kills the poet, encompassing his entire life. In other words, the poet male is served entirely by female energy of the goddess slash muse. The concept of the Triple Goddess would be expanded and changed in later years to what modern paganism knows as the Triple Goddess. Let's talk about his concept of the Oak and Holly Kings. The Oak and Holly Kings do not exist historically. There are a soul, they are a soul invention of Graves. Graves suggested a seasonally reoccurring battle for domination of the year that would happen at the solstices. At the summer solstice, the Holly King would win and usher in the dark half of the year, while at the winter solstice, the Oak King would win and bring back the light half. Grave chose the solstices, two holidays that we have no existing significant information about in Irish mythology. And not the far more important Beltane and Samhain as his turning points of the year. For those not familiar with Beltane and Samhain, they are very important holidays that are a part of the Wiccan Wheel of the Year. I'm going to have an entire video series on the Wheel of the Year coming later in the coming year. We know from surviving myth and folklore that it was at Beltane and Samhain that the year turned from dark to light and back again. So it is highly suspicious to think that there would have been an old belief about kings fighting and turning the year at any other time. This ideal of domination over the year has been widely adopted by many Wiccans and neo-pagan groups and has become a familiar theme to the Wheel of the Year. I feel that there is also a yin and a yang slash good and evil theme here in play as well. Let's talk about Graves' concept of the tree calendar. Note that the tree calendar is neither ancient nor is it druidic, yet another fabrication of Graves. Recommended good reads that help in the understanding of these alleged concepts are The Fabrication of Celtic Astrology by Peter Bruce Ford, and I'll go ahead and put his uh, name and title up on the screen for you. Another book, Celtic Astrology, A Modern Hoax by Gerald Boot. Both debunk the tree calendar and have a great deal of information that I will put. And I'm going to put both of those titles up on the screen so you can uh, hopefully find those titles. There is no surviving information on the exact calendar used by the pagan Irish. There are several problems with the 13-month calendar created by Graves. The calendar does not start in November around Samhain. Uh, the beginning of the new year, uh, and the shift into winter starts on December 23rd to line up with the winter solstice. The birth of the sun god, which the Irish don't have, solar deities in Ireland are completely female. In order to make the calendar work, Graves cut out the letters from 20 to 13, um, Ogham alphabets in early medieval times simply did not work that way. Graves also focused exclusively on the tree ogham, although it was one of many types used at the time. The tree calendar is certainly a workable modern system, but it did not exist before Graves created it. 
Let's talk a little bit about his Druidic Gods. Um, Dru and I'm going to go ahead and put those names up on the screen. Um, they never historically existed. The name seems to be um, based on some root as the word Druid, yet another creation of graves. The other god he created is a real mythical feature, but not a god of the Druids, but comes from Edward Williams' highly controversial and forged uh, Myrian ar archaeology. All right, that's all we have on Robert Graves. Um, again, many of his works still available online. Those books that I mentioned before still available online or for purchase. I highly encourage you to do further research and further reading into the gentleman. In late 1951, the English Parliament repeals all witchcraft laws. The repelling of the witchcraft laws paved the way for individuals like Gardner to talk and uh, to talk about and promote witchcraft. Let's talk a little about the history of the witchcraft laws. 1542, Parliament passed the Witchcraft Act, which defined witchcraft as a crime punishable by death. This was repelled five years later, but restored by a new act in 1562. 1604, a law passed during the reign of James I. The king took an interest in demonology and even published a book on the subject. The 1562 and 1604 acts transferred the trials of witches from the church to ordinary courts. 513 witches were put on trial in the UK between 1560 and 1700. 112 were executed, and that is the known and documented number. There is most likely a higher number of unaccounted individuals that were murdered. The last known execution took place in Devon in 1685. In 1717, the last trials were held in Lancaster, some 500 people in England were executed for witchcraft, but the number is probably far, far more. The Witchcraft Act of 1735 marked a complete reversal in attitudes. Penalties for the practice of witchcraft as traditionally constituted, which uh, by the time was considered by many influential figures to be an impossible crime, were replaced by penalties for the pretense of witchcraft, a person who claimed to have the power to call up spirits or foretell the future or cast spells or discover the whereabouts of stolen goods was to be punished as a vagrant and a con artist, subject to fines and imprisonment. The Act of 1735 abolished the hunting and execution of witches. The max penalty set by the Act was a year of imprisonment, the act came into full effect on June 24, 1736. In 1824, Parliament passed the Vagrancy Act under which fortune-telling, astrology, and spiritualism became punishable offenses. This was repelled in 1951 and replaced by the Fraudulent Mediums Act. The Fraudulent Mediums Act of 1951 prohibited a person from claiming to be psychic, a medium or other spiritualist while attempting to deceive and to make money from the deception. They were only allowed to do so under the pretense of entertainment. Only five prosecutions under this act between 1980 and 1995 uh, were made, all resulted in conviction. In 2008, the Fraudulent Medium Act was repelled. I find that this amazing. 2008 is really not that long ago, but people were still debating about, you know, occult subject matter and who was fraudulent and who wasn't.
Let's move on to 1952 and talk about Doreen Valiente. I'm a huge fan of Valiente and feel that she contributed a great deal to modern witchcraft. She was born on January the 4th, 1922. Her father was Harry Domini, a civil engineer. Uh, he came from a Methodist background. Valiente's mother, Edith, came from a Congressionalist background. Valiente was never baptized. She was nine years old when she had what she called an indescribable mystical experience and saw the veil of reality tremble. At the age of 13, Valiente performed a spell to prevent her mother from being harassed by a co-worker, and she strongly believed that the spell worked. There seems to be different information depending on the source as to when Valiente had her first magical experience, but somewhere uh, between the ages of 9 and 13. Early knowledge of magical practices came from the local library. Valiente wanted to go to art school, but instead gained employment in the factory, and then moved on to work as a clerk and typist at the Unemployment Assistant Board. During World War II, she worked for the Foreign Office Civilian Temporary Senior Assistant Officer as a translator at Betchley Park in South Wales. From 1942 to 1943, Valiente had numerous short-term jobs in Wales, which could have been a cover for intelligence work. Also around this time, Valiente began practicing ceremonial magic with a friend named Zerki. Valiente obtained a magical regalia and notebooks of a deceased doctor who had been a member of the Alpha and Omega Society, a splinter group of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Valiente attempted to learn Hebrew, a language which uh, uses in various forms of ceremonial magic. She had a great interest in John Sidney's book, The Great Beast, which was a biography of Aleister Crowley. Valiente also read Crowley's magic in theory and practice, which she found in a local library. By attending the services of a local Christian spiritualist church, Valiente gained experience with spiritualism and theosophy. Valiente studied the works of Charles Godfrey Leland, Margaret Murray. She became familiar with the Im information on a pre-Christian witch cult religion, but believed it was extinct. Robert Graves, Aleister Crowley. Here again, we see an individual taking what came before and repurposing it. In 1952, Valiente read an article by the reporter Alan Andrews in a magazine titled Witchcraft in Britain, which talked about the folklore center of superstition and witchcraft, as well as Gerald Gardner. Valiente wrote to the museum's director, Cecil Williamson, who put her in contact with Gardner. Valiente and Gardner wrote several letters back and forth which led to a meeting between the two, as well as Gardner's then high priest, Edith Woodward Grimes, or Daffo. Before leaving the meeting, Gardner gave Valiente a copy of his 1949 novel, High Magic's Aid. Allegedly, Gardner did so to gauge her opinion on ritual nudity and scourging, which is whipping or flogging, both of which were present in Gardnerian Wicca. Uh, in my research, this is the first reference I came upon for scorching. Valiente recognized how much of the material of Gardner's was taken from the works of Crowley, even though Gardner claimed it came from ancient sources. In explanation, Gardner said that he received um, this information from the New Forest Coven, and it was fragmentary, and Valiente identified material from Crowley, uh, a poem from... Rudyard Kipling, uh, Alexander Carmichael, Charles Godfrey Leland, and others. There are also there were also Masonic ceremonies. I really like that Via uh, Valiente called out the material. That was a blatant ripoff. She said, "You know, um, I know what this is." With Gardner's permission, Valiente rewrote the Gardnerian Book of Shadows, cutting out large sections that had come from Crowley, making the B Book of Shadows. Um, so it wasn't so obviously laced with outside material. 
Some sources indicate that Valiente feared the negative uh, reputation of Crowley. Valiente worked with Gardner to expand and develop his Book of Shadows, put it into a usable and practical form, and added her own poetic gifts. Valiente essentially created the foundation for modern Rucka by putting her own spin on the material presented by those that came before. In 1953, Valiente wrote Queen of the Moon, Queen if the Stars, a Yule Ritual Invocation. She rewrote much of The Charge of the Goddess, which Philip Hutton would call her greatest single contribution to Wicca. Valiente wrote The Witch's Rune, a chant for use while dancing in a circle. Gardner at one point insisted that Valiente lie to an individual interested in Wicca. He wanted to inform the individual that Valiente was from a long-standing family of hereditary Wiccan practitioners. Valiente aided Gardner in preparing for his second nonfiction book about Wicca. Let's talk about the conflict or falling out between Valiente and Gardner. Gardner's increasing desire for publicity, most ending up negative. Publicity, in Valiente's opinion, compromised the safety of the coven. Valiente was also not enthusiastic about two young people Gardner brought into the coven. Thus, the coven became divided. In 1957, Valiente and another coven member, a coven member drew up a list of proposed coven rules. Gardner countered this with rules that allegedly already existed called Wiccan laws. Of course, these laws were limited. Uh, they limited the control of the high priestess, which at that time was Valiente. Valiente realized that Gardner simply made up the rules. There is also speculation that some of the rift was caused when Valiente questioned the authenticity of Gardner's claims about the age of some of the items that the coven was working with. And in the summer, the coven split. From 1957 to 1969, uh, Valiente formed her own coven still following Gardnerian Wicca, just without the fabricated laws. The coven was short-lived due to arguments between the founders. Valiente then moved to Brighton. In the 1960s, Valiente moved away from Gardnerian Wicca. From 64 to 66, Valiente received a series of trance communications from a spirit claiming to be a witch. She gave the spirit the name Jack Breakspear. This spirit supposedly lived in the early 19th century. Valiente incorporated some of the material provided by this spirit in her book, Witchcraft for Tomorrow. Um, that book is most likely still available online. Valiente befriended journalist Leslie Roberts, who had an interest in the supernatural. Later in the 60s, she mended her friendship with Gardner. In the early 1960s, Valiente developed a correspondence with Patricia and Arnold Crowther. These individuals we're going to talk about in just a bit. In the 60s, Valiente started producing regular articles about Wicca and other esoteric subjects for esoteric magazines. She also started making appearances on radio and television. Apparently, she had a change of heart about publicity. Or maybe she just wanted more positive publicity instead of the negative that Gardner seemed to attract. Valiente became involved with the newly formed Witchcraft Research Association, becoming its second president. In 62, Valiente began a correspondence course run by Raymond Howard, instructing Valiente on a Wiccan tradition known as the Coven of Atho. In 63, on Halloween, she was initiated into the Coven of Atho. Valiente began at the Coven's lowest rank. Valiente copied the teachings she received into notebooks so that she could identify many of the sources from which Howard had drawn in order to fashion his tradition. In 1964, at a speech at the Witchcraft Research Association Halloween dinner, Valiente proclaimed the Wiccan Reed another great contribution to modern witchcraft. In 64, Valiente was introduced to the pagan witch Robert 
Cochrane. Valiente was skeptical of Cochrane's claim to have come from a hereditary family of witches. However, she liked his charisma. Valiente joined uh, Cochrane's coven, the clan of Tubal Cain, becoming the sixth member. This was short lived. Cochrane was openly committing adultery and constantly insulting Gardenerian witches. Valiente confronted him and left. Shortly after this confrontation, Cochrane committed ritual suicide. Valiente appeared in the BBC documentary Power of the Witch, devoted entirely to Wicca. The documentary also featured Alex Sanders. Alex Sanders is also a very important individual that contributed to modern Wicca, and we'll talk about him in a later part of the series as well. I found this video on YouTube. It's of poor quality and feels, at least to me, like a public service announcement to say, hey, not all witches are bad. There is some ritual nudity, which I was surprised at for the 1970s television. Doreen comes across as a very educated, very grounded. I'm going to go ahead and put the link for this video up on the screen so you can view the video if you wish. Valiente founded the Pagan Front, a group that campaigned for the religious rights of Wiccans and other Pagans. Valiente joined a coven in the Silver Ma Malkin area. In 1978, Valiente became friends with Alexandrian Wiccan Stuart and Janet Fafar. Individuals we'll also talk about later in this series. Towards the end of her life, Valiente became concerned about the misconceptions about modern witchcraft as well as the distortions of the original teachings, something that she campaigned in very hard for. Some of Valiente's books, all of which are still available today and I recommend checking out, 1962, Where Witchcraft Lives, 1973, An ABC of Witchcraft, 1975, Natural Magic, 1978, Witchcraft for Tomorrow, and 1989, The Rebirth of Witchcraft. Again, uh, Doreen Valiente, a huge contribution to what we know as modern witchcraft today. I highly recommend doing your own reading and research into her and reading some of her books. Let's talk about Arnold Crowther. Crowther was a skilled stage magician, ventriloquist, puppeteer. Crowther collected unusual puppets and oddities. Crowther had an interest in the occult, Buddhism, paganism, and witchcraft. From the age of eight, he began practicing tricks and performing, perfecting his techniques in the secrecy of his bedroom. By the age of 20, Crowther was a professional magic act. From 1938 to 39, Crowther worked in a cabaret. He entertained Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret Ross at Buckingham Palace. This led to numerous entertainment engagements for the gentry of England. This also put him in contact with many of the day's leading occultists and magicians. During this time, Crowther was a Freemason with an interest in Buddhism. Founder, member, and president of the Puppet Guild, he made 500 puppets in his lifetime. Shortly before World War II, Crowther met Gerald Gardner. Crowther and Gardner shared many similar interests. During the war, Crowther was an entertainer performing where and whenever he was required. Crowther during the war was stationed in Paris. Here Crowther learned of a supposed past life as a Tibetan beggar monk. Crowther believed he was the reincarnation of this individual. Crowther and another officer went to visit Palma's Madame Brooks, uh, who invited both to a seance. Madame Brooks went into a trance and communicated with a male spirit. The spirit claimed to be Crowther's teacher in a previous life. At the seance, an object fell onto the seance table, a Tibetan prayer wheel inscribed with Tibetan script. After the war ended, other Tibetan objects would come into Crowther's possession. A butter lamp, a trumpet made from a human thigh bone, a drum made of a human skull, and a small rattle hand drum. An expert explained to Crowther that a homeless merchant class of yogi regarded as saints used such items. 
1960, Crowther married Patricia Crowther, and we're going to talk about her in the next section of this video. Both will become prominent spokespersons for witchcraft. Crowther authored two books in collaborations with his wife Patricia. Um, in 1965, The Witches Speak, and in 1974, The Secrets of Ancient Witchcraft. Uh, he wrote numerous magazines, articles. Crowther did a radio series. He also created a collection of cartoons in which he drew on the themes of witchcraft. Crowther was influential in introducing Gerald Gardner to Aleister Crowley. All right, let's talk about Patricia Crowther. Her craft name was Thelma. She was a British occultist. Her great-grandmother had been a herbalist, clairvoyant, and fortune teller. Natural talent for the stage. Having a career in cabaret, touring all over the UK. Influential in the early promotion of the Wiccan religion. She wrote several books on witchcraft. Um... She uh, contributed to occult magazines and journals. She did numerous interviews with local and national newspapers. Patricia became the spokesperson and public face for witchcraft. She appeared several times on television and radio. As a minor stage celebrity of the entertainment world, Crowther and her husband had the infrastructure and connections to people that could assist them in getting them on TV and radio. Um... Along with her husband, she uh, founded many flourishing covens throughout the UK. She was born in 1927 in Sheffield. Crowther, from a very young age, displayed powers of clairvoyance. She had an interest in fairies and magic. Her early life was marked by fortune tellers predicting her involvement in witchcraft. Uh, a hypnotist regressed her to um, previous past lives. Allegedly, one of these lives was a 17th century witch named Polly. Crowther claimed to have numerous clairvoyant visions from another past life where she served as a priestess of a goddess who had great power. Uh, she firmly believed she was a witch in a past life and that she was destined to become a great witch in her current life. In 1954, Patricia met Arnold, a stage magician and ventriloquist who induced her to Gerald Gardner, a personal friend of Arnold's, since 1939. In 1960, she was initiated into witchcraft by Gerald Gardner. Uh, Patricia, in turn, initiated Arnold. Later in 1960, Patricia and Arnold were married in a sky-clad hand-fasting ceremony by Gerald. Uh, by October of 1960, Crowther completed her second and third degrees in the coven. Different sources name different times for this, but between 1960 and 1961, she had her degrees. By 1961, Patricia became a high priestess. During her initiation by Gardner, she had another past life recall where she witnessed an initiation ceremony. Crowther is considered one of the early mothers of modern Wicca. She is also considered the heir of Gardner. They shared the same interest for publicity. In 1961, Crowther and then-husband Arnold Crowther founded the Sheffield Coven, in which they were uh, high priest and priestess. In 1971, she wrote and presented A Spell of Witchcraft, a radio program with the BBC Radio Sheffield. It was the first of its kind and explored the history and folklore of witchcraft. The radio program also presented elements of the coven's activities and practices. In 1974, after the death of her husband, Crowther worked for the betterment of the craft, making frequent appearances on TV and radio. Patricia also gave lectures up and down the uh, country. She worked very hard to dispel the many misconceptions surrounding the craft and the old religion. In 1997, she claimed to have received a clairvoyant guidance that she could call herself um, a grandmother of the craft of the wise. Some of Patricia's books, many of which should still be available online today. 1965, The Witches Speak. 73, Witches in Yorkshire. 74, Witch Blood, The Diary of a Witch High Priestess. 1981, Lit Off the Cauldron, A Handbook for Witches. 
1992, The Zodiac Experience. 1992, The Secrets of Ancient Witchcraft and the Witch's Tarot. 1992, Witches Were for Hanging. 1998, One Witch's World, published in America under the name High Priestess. 2002, From Stagecraft to Witchcraft, The Early Years of a High Priestess. And 2009, Coven Sense. All books that you might want to take a look at and do further reading. You might also want to do some further research on Patricia and her husband. All right, that was a lot of information for this episode of The Road of Modern Witchcraft. If you have any questions, comments, or even feel I need to add an important event or individual, please send me an email, tweet, or comment via Facebook or Twitter. You can also send an email. I highly encourage that. Part 6 of The Road to Modern Witchcraft will be coming soon, so please keep a lookout for that. Stay safe and stay enchanted.